in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 5. You there? Say amen. Y'all ready for the word? I'm ready to bring it. Here we go. Verse number 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to another servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. I love this statement. He marveled. Wouldn't it be just absolutely wonderful if the Lord God of all eternity was watching us during the day and say, wow, guys, did y'all see that? Angels, look. If we, could, if we could bring a wow or an amazing moment to Christ, that would be so wonderful. Amen? And we can. This centurion did. He said, Assuredly or truly, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, but I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness, Hear Jesus' words. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. Y'all catch that? As you have believed, so let it be done for you. I'm going to do it one more time because this is the plumb line of truth and Jesus is speaking and just as relevant as it was then, it is just as relevant today. As you have believed, in the same way, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank, praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for the word that you have shared with us. Lord, that it is a plumb line of truth. That, Lord, we can see right and wrong. The world guesses. They change their mind. But, Lord, with you, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you that out of your magnificence, you share that amazing grace that we've sung about. And Lord, because of you, our chains can be gone. Mine can be laid down and walked away from, never to be uh, entangled with again. Father, I do pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would be with us. I pray that there would be no spirit that hinders in this place. I pray, Lord, that there would be freedom to preach and freedom to hear. And Jesus, that you would be high and lifted up. Lord, that we would get a, a clear, fresh vision of you and that you would call us to yourself. What a glorious moment. What a great privilege. Lord, we do not take that for granted. So Jesus be Jesus today. In your name I do pray. Amen. You can be seated. Jesus traveled with his disciples to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, they found themselves at the city of Capernaum. It was a, a city where people from the north would come down and, and they would travel through Galilee. It was a major port city, but it was a major travel city, a, a major road of commerce. But the Romans did not really have a place there. They had a place not too far from there, but they would frequent from there from time to time. And here we find that there was someone who was called simply as a centurion. A centurion was a Roman soldier. You and I would look at him today almost as if he were a businessman. He was looked at with great authority. He had great power given to him by the Roman government. There was a group of people that he was placed over by the Roman government, and they did exactly what he said to do. Now listen to me now. When he gave an order, the power 
of the Roman Empire stood behind that particular word, everything that he said. And they were strong in how they did it. They enforced their rules. They enforced their law. So you would never dare go against anything that this Roman soldier would have to say. In peril for your own well-being. Well, this man had a servant, just a servant. Well, what a servant. And he loved this servant. I think that's one of the highlights of this story. It's this person, if he were like many people, he would just look at this servant as someone that's disposable, someone that really didn't matter. But this one really mattered to him. He mattered to him in such a way. And it says that he had become paralyzed. We do not know why he was paralyzed, and we don't know how much of his body was paralyzed. We just simply know that, that something had happened to him. It could have been in his position as a soldier. It could have been in something that he'd done, some accident that happened. We don't know exactly why. But it says here that though part of his body he could not use anymore because it was paralyzed, we also know that he was dreadfully tormented. The pain was excruciating. Some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about. Where you want to do better, you want things to be good, but they're just not. And you can't get relief from it. You can't rest at night. You can't rest during the day. It's just something that's constantly with you everywhere that you go. A lot of us have gone through different things. A lot of us have had accidents that we've had to go through, sicknesses that we've had to go through. I have a friend who was at his house, and he was getting the, the leaves out of his gutter. Just a very common thing. I don't know how many times he had done it before. But he was just up on the ladder, and he was cleaning the leaves out of his gutter when he lost his balance and fell. But as he fell, his leg went through the ladder and snapped in many places. Now when you look at him today, and he walks... It's a very painful thing just to watch him walk as he is just almost a cripple and he could not have a knee replacement because of how weak the rest of the leg was and he just dry, drug himself around. And every, you know, sometimes things like that can happen in a matter of seconds, right? Just a normal everyday thing. How close have we been to a wreck or been in a wreck or to me, this past week, I mean, I came just about half that close, really just uh, being in a big one, right? And uh, I looked over at Lynn, and, and uh, she said, the Lord did that right there. And I'm like, yeah, I about caused it, but the Lord saved it. Amen. How quickly, how quickly things can change. My niece went to be with the Lord this past week. She had a brain tumor, same thing, it killed my father. And she, uh, she got it. It would have been, this coming November would have been five years. But uh, she fought it. She was brave. She was so sweet. She was so kind. She was so Christ-like in her demeanor in all ways. She just was a, a pleasure to be around her. She's just one of those very, very special people. She was 47 years old, one week shy of 48. But the last few weeks, when she found out that there was nothing else that she could do, that she had gone to Duke University, and they've been helping her all this time, and they found out that uh, that tumor was growing again, and another one was growing, and they just looked at her and said, Heather, there's really nothing else we can do. And she made the decision at that time, there's nothing else. She, she would just do away with all treatments. She would take a steroid, hopefully, to kind of keep the brain from swelling. So the brain just continued to swell and swell. And they said over the last few weeks, she would just hold her head. She had a tumor in the back and a tumor in the front, and she would just hold her head because the pain would be so excruciating. You know, there's just some things you have to go through. That happened Wednesday, and on Wednesday night at church, a lot of the church people were coming to me, and they were sharing their sympathy, and I just said, well, God healed her. You know, you can't scare me with heaven. I mean, just the thought of going to a place where all of the things that we have, the, the hardships and the trials that we have to walk through through this earth are gone forevermore. And to receive all the goodness of the, of the majesty of the most loving heavenly God, that he has all of those things that he holds and he keeps, and he, by his grace, extends those things to us. What a glorious privilege it is to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Some people, if they reach a certain place, they get longing for heaven more than they do wanting to stay here on earth. This centurion saw his friend suffer. And when he heard that Jesus was close, and when he heard the stories of what Jesus could do, he didn't think about his own reputation. He didn't think about himself at all, really. He just said, I wonder if God could do for my servant what he's done to so many others. And he goes to, to uh, Capernaum, and he finds Jesus there. And when he does, he goes immediately to his presence. And look what it says here in verse number 5. Lord, Master, when so many people would look up to him, but he was looking up to Jesus. My servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. But look what it says right before that. Sir, a centurion came to him pleading. I think this tells us of the love that he had for his centurion, for his soldier, his servant. As a matter of fact, it has been said that when we intercede on the behalf of someone else, that's when we are the closest to being like Jesus in all of our life. Just to love on someone else the way Jesus did. He was pleading. It's actually sometimes translated, he was begging Jesus. And he just says, my, my, my servant is paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. But notice Jesus' reply, verse number 7. I will come and heal him. I mean, the centurion really doesn't have to say anything else, but Jesus just says, I'll come and I'll heal him. At that point, now church, listen, we're talking today about faith. It is the most important thing we as Christians need to have in our life. Grateful for God's grace. Grateful for his mercy. Grateful for his love. But our reaction needs to be and should be faith. Faith is believing. Come on, church. It is trusting. It is knowing and acting upon it. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that we cannot please God unless we are living by faith. And I'm not too sure how often in our life we are truly living beyond ourselves and trusting in what Christ can do and Christ alone. A lot of times we're living out of, well, this is normal. This is customary. I can do this. As you gave it or will give in the love offering, I can afford this. I can't afford that. We'll limit our life. We'll say, I'll do this, or we'll think it through and say, I won't do this. But when we look at something and it doesn't make sense, but we know the one who can make right out of it, and we trust in Christ through the circumstances, oh, what God can do. So based upon Jesus' statement, I will come and heal him, the centurion doesn't argue with the, the healing statement, but he says, no, Lord. Look what he says in verse 8. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. I love this facet here. I'm not worthy. I think it's a wonderful thing when we see ourselves for what we are. I, I really wonder, when was the last time you looked at something and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. As a Roman soldier, maybe there were some things that would show a life that maybe he didn't think Jesus would, would approve of. I'm, but, but you're master. I'm calling you Lord. I'm just a soldier. But listen to this statement of faith. He said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. Now, Jesus already said, I will come and heal him. And based upon that, look, Jesus didn't say, I'll come and try. 
He said, I'll come and heal him. And based upon that, this centurion understood that the fact of the matter was that his servant would be healed. Now the only thing he's talking about is the way. And he says, because you are who you are, you don't have to come to my house. Because you are who you are, just speak a word. Now, he was a man who understood authority. He understood because he was under authority, he had authority. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to this one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He lived every day being a person of authority simply because, not how good he was, but because he was under authority. And he knew Jesus was under God, under the power of the Almighty. So he says, all you have to do is speak a word. And the power of God, the Holy Spirit, will take those words and make it come alive. That Jesus had already said, I will heal. This centurion is standing on the promises of that statement. And he's enacting his faith. You don't have to come. You just say the word. Just say the word. That's bold. That's faith. That's God honoring and that amazed Jesus. Look what it says here in verse number 10. I sh surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. I've never seen anybody down here with such great faith. The Jews should know this, but this is a Roman. This guy got it. Do we get it? This guy saw something powerful in Jesus. Do we believe that? Do we believe that when Jesus speaks, that settles it? Then why do we live in fear? Why do we question? Because you see, we see ourselves separated from him. But by faith, we can become united with him. One with him. Jesus said, many people will say that they have faith. No, they, they're not going to make it. They will be cast into outer darkness. And he says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, it was a sad fact that this, this, this centurion had a servant in such pain. But Jesus says it'll be even worse for those people who live their life and never truly know me. They will be told, depart from me. I do not know you. And there will be weeping. And this word here means uncontrollable sobbing. A life just absolutely broken and all the emotion, emotions on the raw end and just not being able to control it because of the sorrow and the gnashing of teeth. That's when your teeth are get grinding together because of the pain. What this servant had was bad. But a person who lives that does not know God as their Savior and Lord, who does not come to him in his saving grace by faith, they will be separated from God and his love forever. And there will be so much sorrow because of that and so much pain in their life because of that. But to this man, he, he saw faith. So in verse 13, he said, go your way. It's okay. You can go home now. He says, as you have believed, in the same way that you have believed, to the value of your belief, in the same way, so let it be done unto you. Jesus said all we need is childlike faith. Just to look, to believe, and to act upon it. He's not asking that you do something supernatural. Just believe that he can do something. I just want to know. Are we trying to do the best we can? Or are we trying to receive the best that he can? Are you trying to do it, you know, 
It is very seldom that I talk to someone about the Lord as uh, Jesus as saving someone to for them to receive Jesus Christ in their heart and life. It's very seldom that I talk to someone and they don't say these words. I'm a pretty good person. And then they'll begin to tell me all the reasons why God's supposed to love them, how God, God sent them into his kingdom. That's works. And the Bible says that all of our works are filthy rags. You're not good enough. You're not going to make it on your own. You're not going to so impress God that God's going to say, okay, let him in. He doesn't need the blood of Jesus. Just let him in. He's a good fella. It's not the way it works. What he's going to say is, I love you. What he would go on to do, he would die on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty of our sins. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. Now, that's a positive statement, but it's also a negative statement. As you have believed, or as you have lived in unbelief, so let it be done unto you. Do you trust me? As you trust him, God will honor. As you don't trust him, you're literally tying your hands behind your back. And I love this last phrase there. It says, and the servant was healed that same hour. That tells me that he went home, and when he found his servant healed, he said, when? When? And when he heard the time that his servant was healed, he knew it was the same time that Jesus said, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done unto you. He knew that it was the hand of God that had done it. Take your Bible and go over to the book of Romans chapter number 10. This is really where I left off last week. I wanted to pick up today. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. So what we need is a word from God. What this centurion got was he got a confirming word from God and he, his faith came out of that confirming word of what Jesus had said. So we need the same thing. When I say that we should live by faith, that doesn't mean you just decide what you're going to do and then you just believe it no matter what. You're not that smart. Was that insulting? I'm not that smart either. But hold on. Though I can't just say, this is what I believe, Lord, make it happen. I can't do that. But when I get a word from God, when I get a word from God, now I can stand on that. So Romans 10, verse number 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to hear a word from God. And this word, word is not logos. That's what I shared last Sunday. It's the word rema, which means when God comes down and personally taps you on the shoulder and whispers a truth to you individually. When God comes and speaks to your heart, you, you can call it a word, you can call it an, uh, an impression. Now, I, I tell you one thing, when God speaks, you know it'll be him. Amen? People talk about anointing sometimes, and as a preacher, I never want to preach without the anointing of God on me, right? People say, well, how do you know? Look, if you've ever heard of somebody preach without the anointing, and you've been around somebody who's preached with the anointing, you can tell the difference. I call it the amen of the Holy Spirit, right? And when you're looking for a word from God, you don't have to guess. But when you know it's from him, you'll know. Someone will say, well, how do you know? I, I promise you, you'll know. I promise you. 
when I accepted the call to preach, it was never a matter of if God loved me. I, and I just wanted to know that it was him and not me. But once I knew it was him, I said, yes, sir. I'll do whatever, whenever, however, to whoever. But I just wanted to know it was from him, right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the very individual, personal word from God. Look what it says in verse number 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Now, hold on. Time out. That's not talking about me, the preacher. The term in uh, Ephesians 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's the word poimen. That's a position. And I, I, I fulfill that. I'm seeking to be the pastor of New Holland Baptist Church. That's God's way of how he put together that, right? Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, and in other places. But that's not this word. This, mean, this is the word, the herald, the one who would stand up and proclaim, herald the good news, tell the good news, shout, em emphatically, lovingly, kindly share. So don't think right here that he's talking about me. He's talking about me as a Christian, but not me as my position in the church. This is all of us as Christians. So let me, let me say it again. How shall they hear without someone to tell them, is what he's saying. And how shall they tell them unless they are sent? God tells us to speak to someone, and we do. Look in verse Number eight, what does it say? The word, the rhema, the individual word from God. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the rhema, the word of faith that we're sharing, that we're preaching. That if you Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Doesn't say you might. Doesn't say he'll think about it. He's already thought about it. He's already made up his mind. That if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can stand on the word of God when he directs it to you. That's not your word. That's not your belief. You can't make it happen. But you can, you can receive what he has promised. He promised. He gave his life for you so that you can receive it. Whether you feel up to it that day or not, if you've come to a place in your, in your life where you know that you have sinned, you confess that, you say the same thing about that that he did, and you know who he is, and you believe in him and trust in him, and you know what he did, and you speak that. Look what it says, very plainly, very, very, for, verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, say it, church. If you cry unto him and you call upon him, the author of salvation, the one who made it possible, you don't do it out of what you're, you're just hearing from him. And by faith, you're believing in that. And you're trusting in that. Ephesians 2, for by grace, not by anything you've done, you have been saved through, say it, faith. You're acting upon what you know. He is placed there before you. You can believe that. You can trust that. Now, what happens if you go out and you sin again? You will. I love what 
Paul said to the church in Galatia, the, Gal the, the Galatian letter, they had this group of people, Paul had shared that you're saved by faith, and, and they, they had these Jews come in and said, okay, you can receive Jesus by faith, but you, re, you remain saved by your works, what you do. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul looked at him and said, Oh, foolish Galatians. And I like this word. We don't use it very much, but it's, it's a good word. He said, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who taught you such nonsense is what he's saying. Let me, let me quote it to you. He said, uh, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to, to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Did you get saved because how good you were? Or did you just hear the rhema? the personal calling of God, the wooing and the belief that comes with that. He says, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Church, listen to me. There's two things you need to know. Number one, you're saved by believing and trusting in Christ and Christ alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. But number two, you're not going to remain saved by your works because we're going, to, we're going to sin the rest of our life. We'll fight it. We'll surrender to Jesus. We'll work on it. We'll pray over it. But nobody's going to get perfect. And only those people who think that they're perfect, the only person they're fooling is themselves. The rest of us know. Now, I will be perfect one day. But as long as you see me breathing, I'm not there yet. Are y'all good with that? I mean, one day when I close my eyes to this world, I'll be in the presence of the glory of God forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. And I am supposed to seek to be obedient unto God. Old Testament, that's the word they used was obedient. But chapter 11, or chapter 3, verse 11, he said, but the just shall live by faith. We find our salvation by faith, but we do our living by faith. Oh, what God could do if we just let him. So Satan's going to come up and he's going to start whispering in your ear, oh, you're not worthy. You hadn't done this you haven't done this if you you're not a christian you don't do this and you don't do that and you don't give this and you don't give that and you don't preach this and you don't preach that and he'll come and he'll make you feel about half that small but i'm here to tell you all he's trying to do is put chains on you that jesus has already set you free from your salvation is eternally, eternally, eternally taken care of. But church, listen to me. We are also living by a faith deficit. If Hebrews eleven six 6 is right, the only way that we can please God is by faith. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you truly did something that was by faith and faith alone? Most of us live our life by what we think, what we believe, what we want. I mean, Peter said you got to get out of the boat before you can walk on the water, right? Not too many of us walking on water. Not too many of us trusting in something else. I heard a preacher say this week, I'm going to say this in closing. He said the problem is, he says, we're living such normal lives when God's called us to so much more. He said, you, something happens to me, happens to you. You run to the doctor, and you run to the doctor. Then, when he can't do anything, then you'll go to Jesus and ask Jesus to do something when the Lord's been there all along. Now, folks, I'm not trying to say we don't need to, to, to have doctors in our life. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying your trust needs to be in him. 
It needs to be the cloud of glory that covers everything in your life. When all you're doing is doing what you can do, you're living at a faith deficit. And God has called us to so much more. We have not because we ask not. And I want to tell you, we're not asking because we're not trying. We're not believing. We're not trusting. What could God do in our lives if we truly lived by faith? If God's given you a word, you stand on the promises. And it doesn't matter what anything that comes against you and assails you. You can trust in him. You can believe in him. And he'll lead you through. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what God can do.